Okay, I want to thank everyone for coming to the Bay Area's annual celebration of the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. I'm Richard Burmack with the Bay Area Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, an organization of the ALBA dedicated to keeping alive the legacy of activism of the American volunteers who defended the Spanish Republic against fascism in the 1930s. Probably everybody here knows that. Um, anyway, we'd like to thank Josiah and the staff of Medicine for Nightmares Bookstore for allowing us to use their space, James Tracy for helping us set this up, and of course, Alba for sponsoring the event. I'd like to point out Dennis back there at the table, who's an executive assistant for Alba's office in New York, who's here to help out with today's event, and was here a few other day, days before as well. <laughs> today's program is about the connection between the Lincoln Brigade and the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. Now, both organizations were built on international solid solidarity and opposing racism. racism. We'll also celebrate Lincoln Brigade's contribution to the labor movement by honoring Lincoln vet and ILWU leader, Archie Brown, and his wife, Han, who is the treasurer of the Bay Area Post. When it comes to international so solidarity today, July 26th is a special day it's very auspicious that we're meeting today. In 1953, Fidel Castro attacked the Moncada military barracks and the Cuban revolution began. The, the vets were very much uh, staunch supporters of Cuba. They opposed, opposed the boycott and used to raise money for the William Solar Pediatric Clinic in Havana. Following our program, we'll have a reception with Cuban food to honor the Cuban revolution. We, we, did, we couldn't get any mojitos, unfortunately. Our speakers today include Robin Walker and Brian McWilliams of the ILWU, Peter Carroll of ALBA, Stephanie Brown, and Sean Farrell, the daughter, the daughter and grandson, or Archie Brown, and, and several other people. A after the speakers, we'll have a discussion with questions and answers to be joined by ILWU historians Harvey Schwartz and labor activist, documentary photographer David Bacon. At this moment, I'd like everyone, anyone who has a relative or friend of a Lincoln Brigade veteran to stand. And if you're on Zoom, you can enter the name of the vet in, in the chat. Okay, that's our friends too. Hey, so we just... We'd also like to take this moment to remember the passing of Corrine Thornton and Frida Tams, the wives of Lincoln vets, Nate Thornton and Al Tams. We'd also like to remember musician Bruce Barthol, who performed at the Lincoln Brigade events for decades. On December 3rd, at the Howard Zinn Book, Book Fair in San Francisco City College, we'll screen Eyes of the World Were on Madrid, the video of Bruce's last performance at, at last year's event. The video will tell the story of the Spanish Civil War and the inter international brigades with music and dramatic readings. The same, you know, I'm sure a lot of you saw that. You've seen this before in the last 20 or 30 years of the programs we've done that. Today, we have a special guest from Spain, Bettina Linares. Bettina's mother, Ana Perez, was president and one of the organizers of the Amigos organization that sponsored the celebrations of the International Brigade in Spain in 1996, where many valve members att attended. Let's welcome Bettina. First of all, I want to thank Alba and the ILWU for the invitation to speak here today. I can contribute little to what was what will be said about Archie Brown in his different roles as a father brigade member or union activist. How did I end up here today? In 1996, I volunteered in the organization of the tribute to the 65th anniversary of the arrival of the International Brigades in Spain, organized by the Amigos, the Abi. And there I met many brigadistas and their families, including the Browns. 27 years later, in a deep friendship that goes beyond that, they have become like family to me. So if I am here today, it's really thanks to Archie Brown, who, like other men and women, came to fight in the Spanish Civil War to defend freedom and fight against the fascist 
that was spreading throughout the world. We find ourselves in a historical moment that may lead, lead us to believe that we haven't made significant progress in the fight for a better world. Or worse, that we are regressing and losing the achievements we once took for granted. Maybe we are mistaken. It's not my intention right now to try to analyze how we have arrived almost 100 years later after the start of the Spanish Civil War and the Second World War to a situation that in many aspects resembles those years. But I want to remember and reflect on the importance of class consciousness and internationalism as transformative elements of society opposing individualism, nationalism, and globalization. There is a reactionary wave trying to advance worldwide. It's through, this word is horrible, <laughs> through and often unequal, it's a thug and often unequal fight. In this struggle, trade unions and the defense of workers' rights on an international level are crushing, crucial. Last Sunday, as you know, there were general elections in Spain. On this occasion, it was more important than ever to defend our democracy at the ballot box. Today, we celebrate that there is a majority in Spain that rejects hatred, sexism, regression, exclusion, inequality, xenophobia, homophobia, and insults. This majority remains greater than the other negative forces, but we must continue to fight. The battle is not over. Democracy has won for now. The fight must go on in the neighborhoods, on the streets, on social media, and in the workplaces. And because, and because the fight must always continue, I would like to conclude by recalling these words from Bertolt Brecht. There are men who struggle for a day and they are good. There are men who struggle for a year and they are better. There are men who struggle many years and they are better still. But there are those who struggle all their lives. These are the indispensable ones. And Archie one, Archie Brown, was one of those indispensable ones. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Bettina. I really like that. Keep you on the struggle going from the streets to social media. That's quite a quite a ways, <laughs> and quite quite inclusive. So our next speaker is Claude Potts, librarian for the Romance Languages Collection at UC Berkeley, who's working on a plaque commemorating Robert Merriman to be installed on the UC campus. So Claude, tell us all about this. Uh, hi, everyone. Great to be here. Um, um, so a few, uh, I guess in 2006, I worked with someone who you probably all know, Peter Glazer and others uh, on the campus to do a couple exhibits in the library, one in the Bancroft and one in the uh, Doe Library. And um, ever since I, I had that great experience on doing research on the Spanish Civil War, I've been very interested in it and, and anything related to it. Um, and including, um, I don't know if you all know, but about um, six years ago, um, the U UC Berkeley was offered a uh, memorial plaque from a research group at the University of Barcelona um, in uh, a tribute to Robert Merriman, who was a graduate student and also fought in the Civil War. Um, at, well, he was at Berkeley and fought in the Civil War in Spain, of course. Um, so um, we have been working hard. Uh, it's one thing to be offered a plaque. It's another to actually get that plaque installed and um, put in a prominent place, especially outdoors. So. Um, a few of us have been working very hard at that process. Uh, the good news is that it has been approved by the chancellor's office, um, many space committees. Um, the, the project has been approved, but now it's time to raise money. So that's part of the reason I'm uh, talking today. Um, um, and uh, so we're at the very beginning of a fundraising effort in order to get the plaque um, brought from Spain, um, creating actually a, a, a a secondary plaque, which would be in English, kind of explaining the context, and um, we would install it 
hopefully on a gigantic boulder somewhere near the Memorial Glade. If you know where the Memorial Glade is in the center of the campus, um, which is also symbolic since uh, Merriman loved uh, studying in the Doe Library. So it would be close to a place and he, he lived in the north side of campus as well. Um, so um, let's see, I'm going out of order of my notes, which is better, um, <laughs> always better. Um, I think many of you probably know about Merriman, but he was born in Humboldt County, grew up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, he worked um, between uh, high school and college in his father's business as a lumberjack um, and also in a paper mill. Um, he came to Berkeley, went to undergrad at University of Nevada, um, but came to Berkeley in fall of 1932. Um, he was married to Marion Stone, um, later to become Wachtel, uh, a few months later, and she, she joined him in Berkeley. And a couple of years later, they, they took off um, to do, uh, he got a fellowship to go to um, the Soviet Union. Um, so his path was quite different. Um, he, he didn't go through the common turn to, um, to Barcelona, but showed up on his own in Barcelona and went through quite a rigorous process of making sure they weren't spies and so forth. Um, but um, uh, one more, thank you, uh, Peter, for this great uh, reminding me of this uh, important um, connection to today's talk is that um, you know, I don't think um, Merriman ever had the chance to be in a union in the, he was a student and did kind of odds and ends, different work. Um, but when the, um, the waterfront strike um, took place in 1934, he was, um, like many um, Berkeley professors and students, was very active in supporting that. And he worked at a, um, he worked at the publicity office, office in San Francisco and um, encouraged other students from Cal to, to, to join that. Um, on the other side, there was the Cal football coach who uh, who was um, hiring, uh, or I don't know if they were getting paid, but encouraging the toughest linebackers to go there and break the strike. Um, so Merriman was actually involved in um, um, the Longshoreman strike. Um, okay, I probably used my two to three minutes. Um, okay. Uh, So yeah, I think I covered it all other than I'm gonna pass out um, a couple handouts about, um, we have a page up. Um, we are working through the Spanish and Portuguese department. We have, a, that's our sponsor on campus. So that's, uh, we put up a page on their site and we are um, really beginning that campaign now. And um, if you're interested in just knowing about the events we have for the fall, um, I have a sign up sheet or you can um, go to the website um, on the back there and, and send us an e email. Um, but that is it, thank you so much. Okay, is that better than uh, handing that? Okay, okay, I, I'll help. Um, Okay. I'll just pass this out. Thank you. Well, that was great. And maybe a lot of people don't know, it, but Marion Wachtel, Merriman's wife, was actually the founder, one of the founders of the Bay Area Post for the Bay Area and Lincoln Brigade and recruited Peter um, um, Bruce Barthol to the friends of the Lincoln Brigade. An injury to one, an injury to all. Originally the motto of the industrial workers of the world who embraced workers of all races, nationalities, and profession, the message of international solidarity and anti-racism became a root value of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, and they eventually adopted the motto as their own. Originally, the ILA, originally part of the ILA, the International Longshoremen's Association, a corrupt conservative and East Coast organization. In 1934, the West Coast Longshoremen rebelled and formed a coalition of all the West Coast ports from San Pedro to Seattle. Led by Harry Bridges, they reached out to other maritime workers unions, including seamen, warehouse workers, teamsters, and they succeeded in shutting down all the ports on the West Coast. In previous strikes, employers had recruited African Americans from the South as strike breakers. But this time, under Breeder Bridges' leadership, the union actively recruited African Americans and welcomed them into the union. They were one of the first unions to do this, similar to how the Lincoln Brigade being one of the first integrated battalions. 
The Waterfront Worker, the union's mimeograph paper, called for non-discrimination on the basis of creed, color, or political beliefs. The Longshoremen's solidarity won the hearts of other working people, making them a cause celebre. When two workers were shot dead by the police on July 5th during the strike, which became known as Bloody Thursday, the entire city went out on strike. San Francisco general strike became an inspiration across the nation. A revolution was happening in the labor movement. The Congress of Industrial Organization, the CIO, met in 1936 with a call to organize the unorganized, both skilled and unskilled workers. The West Coast Longshoremen left the ILA and formed the ILWU, a CIO union. They began the march inland, an organizing drive across the country, organizing longshore and warehouse workers and anyone else that needed them. They attempted organizing the South and took on civil rights struggles. Labor and the CIO became front page news, but everything in the world wasn't great. Next to headlines about labor struggles were articles about Hitler's rise to power in Germany. Union members realized that their battles against employer thugs, the Pickertons and the Klan were the same as the battles against Nazi black shirts in Europe. The same year as the CIO convention began, in 1936, the Spanish Civil War broke out. Defending the Spanish Republic against fascism became part of the Union struggle. Union newsletters carried stories about the war, encouraging their members to join the international brigades. Many ILW members and other Union members responded to the call. In Spain, they joined in a common struggle with workers from all over the world all fighting for the same things, equality, universal health care, education, women's rights, religious freedom. The war may have ended in defeat for the Spanish Republic, but the fighters returned home with an increased sense of solidarity. They formed the Veterans of the American, the Veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade organization, pledging to continue the fight against fascism and for social justice. It was only nat natural that they would join the union movement, fighting for workers' rights along with civil rights, and the ILWU especially welcomed them in. The ILWU never lost sight of the struggle against racism. When Pearl Harbor happened, the U.S. government began rounding up Japanese Americans. ILWU International Secretary Treasurer Lou Goldblatt testified before Congress, strongly opposing the internment. His testimony would later give the union the ability, the credibility to organize sugarcane workers in Hawaii. When World War II ended, the Cold War began. The ALW supported the United Nations, opposed the Marshall Plan and US imperialism. It began organizing international con connections. When during the Longshoreman strike of 1946, President Truman threatened to use the military to break the strike, the ALWU responded with telegrams from maritime unions all over the world, pledging that if Truman used the army to load ships and the Navy to sail the ships, workers from the other Pacific ports would refuse to unload them and they would sit in the ocean. Truman backed down. But in 1946, in 1946, over 45 million US workers went on strike. In response, Congress passed the Taft-Hartley Act, prohibiting communists from holding office union office and any other and many other anti-union regulations. The NLRB began to certify, decertifying CIO unions with prog progressive leadership. The ILWU lost most of the warehouse locals they had organized across the country and a lot many other locals. Many unions buckled under government pressure. But the ILWU's strong stance against racism gave them the loyalty of 30,000 sugarcane workers they had organized in Hawaii, giving them the economic power to resist that other unions lacked. The ILWU also launched, the ILWU was also attacked for having leaders like Harry Bridges, who was accused of, by the government of being a communist, and Lincoln vet Archie Brown, who was a predominant, prominent communist. You'll hear more about Archie later in the program. The ILWU became a refuge for those blacklisted. They took in VALB members like Nate Thornton, who joined Local 34, and Alva Bessie, a member of the Hollywood 10, who worked in the office. Proud of the legacy of fighting for social justice against racism, I was hired and, and for justice and, and against racism, I was hired to create a series of photographic murals telling the union's story by former ILWU education director Gene Verana. 
My connections with Valve and Alba was part of the reason I was hired. I collaborated in the project with Robin Walker and Harvey Schwartz, who you'll hear from, hear from later. Robin Walker is the present education director and head of the ILW archives. She's going to tell you more about the importance of their history and how they keep their legacy alive. Robin. <laughs> Thank you. Let me just start give you a hug. I'm so happy to work with you again. Thank you, Richard, for inviting me. Um, so I'm here to talk about the ILWU library and the union's use of their legacy and their history to inform and educate their members, inspire new leaders, and encourage union participation. When Richard asked me to speak here, I thought that it kind of was a divergence from the rest of the program. But I'm really aware every day of the contributions that not just um, Abraham Lincoln Brigade veterans made to the ILWU, but the old left folks in general made to the values of this organization and um, the principles and structure that continue today. Those folks formed a library, a labor union library in 1942. And it was formed primarily to help support the union during the industrial changes that were spurred by the wartime mobilization. They hired a librarian. They've always had a professional librarian on staff. The first person they hired, the library is named after her. Her name's Ann Rand, not Ayn Rand, Ann Rand. Um, and Ann Rand was really cool. She um, she collected books. She was noted for her helpfulness to rank and file folks who wanted to learn about decisions that the union was making, issues that the union was facing. And um, she created what at the time was one of the best labor and industrial relations collections on the West Coast. Those records, the records of the union's decisions were then and have always been available to rank and file members who want to come in and learn about their union's history. And um, my own job, I also help locals um, and individuals preserve history that might be kept in attics or basements in their homes or the local union halls. So when I was kind of preparing this, I was thinking you can see the value of either an organization or even a society by what they choose to collect. And um, we're an institutional archive. So we have the records of the institution and there's a lot of like corporations that have their own archives. I mean, there's Levi's down here that has a little museum about their genes. Um, but the ILWU has collected beyond their institutional records. So they have more than just their executive board meeting minutes and their convention proceedings and the correspondence of their officers. Um, although like primarily that internal business is our collection, they also in the early 1980s, uh, secured a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to collect oral histories of just ordinary rank and file folks. And we have an incredible collection. They initially, Harvey Schwartz is here, was one of the principal um, people collecting those oral histories. Uh, they collected 206 oral histories of just regular rank and file people. Um, they focused not just on big ports like San Francisco, but on small areas like Coos Bay, Oregon. They interviewed plantation workers on the island of Lanai. Um, they interviewed cotton compress workers in the um, California Central Valley. And they collected um, 206 oral histories. And since then, Harvey Schwartz has been uh, our curator of our oral history collection and has gone on to collect, we have over 300 interviews. They do include interviews of ILWU elected leaders, but really the heart of this collection is the stories of regular working people. Oh, I also want to point out that those articles went on to become um, those interviews went on to become articles in the dispatcher newspaper. Um, and they went, there's a book solidarity stories that was published in 2009 or 2010. 
um, that highlights those histories. The union also utilizes their collections for the education program. Um, there's a course for longshore workers, longshore history and traditions that talks about the history of the union's past strikes and labor relations. As Richard mentioned, they also uh, sponsored two exhibits and the catalogs are here and we have some extras if folks wanna take these home. Um, this was an exhibit on the 1934 strike and the origins of the ILWU. And then that was met with a lot of success. So they, they sponsored another exhibit on the 1948 strike, which is uh, no less an important event for the union. Those exhibits took collections from our library and also Richard went up and down the coast into pen met with pensioners. Um, they dug stuff out of the attic. He went to museums and libraries and gathered all of these items together, took photographs, digitized things, and made this beautiful um, 50 foot wall of images that can travel to locals. And I have some pictures. I'll leave them up on the table when I'm done. So I can answer questions about our programs at the end, but when I was preparing for this, um, one of the things that I thought about was I was trying to look for some images that were evocative of today's presentation. And one that I found was of the Fort Point group um, some folks from there. And if you don't, I think most of you probably know about them. But they were a group of old timers, including a lot of Abraham Lincoln Brigade veterans who met regularly to walk um, down at Fort Point. And if you go down there, there's several benches that, com that um, commemorate their memory with plaques on them. And I'll just pass this picture around. It's a few of them and some others at the Jeremiah O'Brien. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Robin. And we have several people that have that go out, used to go on those four point walks here. We'll be interested in seeing the photos. So our, our next speaker is Brian McWilliams. He was president of the ILWU from 1994 to 2000. He has been a strong supporter of Valve in Alba. He was also, I think, in the leadership of Local 34, which had Valve members like um, Nate, Nate Thornton and many other people. Brian. Well, thank you. It's a privilege to be here. And on, in terms of educating ourselves and our members, uh, it doesn't all happen in the library. I was fortunate enough to be just a youngster, among many others, uh, having to rub elbows with these people every day at the job, having union meetings every day in the hall in the morning getting taught about the history of the union and how we collectively work together for social justice issues, how we, we it was indoctrinated into us that we actually had the power as workers to, to accomplish something meaningful in our world. We weren't just individuals and the union was uh, key central to that whole ability and wonderful things happened. There were people every day that had been in the 34 strike, the 46 strike had been, were political or, or economic refugees from around the world. It was an incredible place to work. And uh, you couldn't spend much time there without, paying, if, if you paid any attention, <laughs> without learning about what uh, you wouldn't have learned at all in school. And Archie Brown was a very big part of all that. He was, uh, Every Friday in the pay one, in the pay line, he'd be handing out brochures. He'd be encouraging people to participate. He was relentless. Uh, he always had good advice, unless you were betting on the horses. But uh, he was a, a, a true, absolute activist, along with others. And it was, you know, none of us were born knowing any of this stuff. We had to be taught somehow. We had to learn. We had to, through osmosis, understand it in and and that that was instilled in us on the job site 
working on the other end of the sack with people. It was a very different way to educate workers. It's, I'm so sorry, isn't so available now. People today work with machines and radios and it's a very, it's not their fault, you know, exactly. But I wish there was a better way to uh, instill this kind of education into people, this activism, this, this commitment to social justice and making this a better world. And Archie was absolutely one of those people. You know, I work with, uh, people would tell me about, well, Nate Thornton, who went to Spain with his father as a, as a team. Kind of an amazing story. He wasn't the only one. But, you know, you, you work with these people, you start to understand the commitment they had and, and what they were willing to sacrifice for. It really has a huge impact on on what you do with the rest of your life. You can't not be uh, totally drawn into it. And I'm so thankful for the, those experiences. Um, some people would tell me that, you know, I was going to Spain, but the State Department found out, so they pulled my passport, so they couldn't go. At the same time that the Nazis are using Spain for a, a, a test site, our State Department is refusing to let people go fight against fascism. And these were those kinds of uh, uh, learning opportunities we had working with these people every day that were part of it, that had been part of it since the beginning, that had, had uh, helped form the union and made it really clear that collectively, as a community, not as individuals, as a community, we have the ability to respond and to change things and make this a better world for everybody. So anyway, that's my experience of Archie. And now, uh, oh, by the way, Archie wasn't doing all this by himself. You know, he had a great partner, Hun. And uh, they were equally involved together. She was just as much of an activist and just as supportive and, and of all of these issues. And uh, she, she really deserves a, a lot of credit. So anyway. To that end, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and uh, we'll carry on. You want to say something? Oh, okay. So, yeah, eventually we're going to have questions and answers, but and and uh, the discussion. And um, Steve is going to Steve Birnbaum going to hand out pieces of paper so you can write down questions to ask so that I can read them because we can't, we aren't able to, we aren't sure if the mics will pick up the audience. Um, and then, and then of course we're gonna have, we're gonna have a, a, a discussion after the speakers and then we're gonna have a reception after that. Um, so, and you're gonna hear more about Archie in, in a little bit. So Peter, do you wanna come up and Uh, my name's Peter Carroll, and uh, I'm the, uh, and what am I, the Emeritus Chairman of the Board of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives. And I've been involved with the Lincoln Brigade people for a very long time, uh, part of a group that became associates of the Bay Area Vets uh, back in 1984. I got to know most of these people. They're wonderful people. They were crazy. They were hard to talk to. They were hard to live with. Um, when, when I wrote my book, I was thinking of having a chapter on their children. And I thought, oh, no, I can't go there because the truth will come out. And uh, we couldn't do that. But they asked me to talk about Archie, and it's a real pleasure. I, I did about 12 hours of oral history with him back in the 80s. And... Uh, he told me things that he'd never spoken to even Hunt about because it wasn't her business and it might jeopardize their family uh, if people knew about it, that she knew about. Um, a lot of us have come to California and San Francisco from somewhere else. Now, Archie was one, but nobody came like Archie did. He was uh, 13 years old. His... Uh, Mother made him three sandwiches, and um, 
He took newspaper and wrapped it around his clothing for warmth in the dead of winter, jumped on a freight train, 13 years old, all by himself, and headed for California, where he had an older sibling who was working for the movement in the East Bay. So uh, after about a day on the train, riding the rods and everything, one of the railroad bulls came by and found him and threw him off the train. And he landed on his rear end. And uh, he said there were a couple of wobblies, you know, the guys from the IWW, right? Industrial workers of the world, who they call wobblies, who, uh, who came in and helped him. You know, he picked him up off the, the gravel. and. Uh, they started talking about classes and they're talking about classes and warfare. Archie told me, he said, I thought they were talking about the seventh grade versus the eighth grade, but uh, he, he learned pretty quick <laughs> and uh, wound up in, in the East Bay. And uh, at that age of 13, got a job as a newspaper boy, you know, delivering newspapers, ran around and all that stuff. Well, Archie, at that tender age in 1929, organized a newspaper boys' union. And they uh, had the rates and the, and the deal, and they, it was in his blood somehow. And uh, he went, once that, you know, ended, he, he just continued. He, uh, he joined the YCL in, in Oakland. He was already famous for his speeches, his ability to talk on soapboxes. I found letters in the archives later. Someone said, oh, I remember when Archie was doing this and saying that. And he made me so solid about it. It's, it's, it was beautiful. Sort of like what Brian was telling you, how you, the word of mouth goes around. And he was, uh, he was really good. Anyway, uh, as a member of the YCL, he went down to Southern California to organize some of the farm workers. And uh, what the, he had one group with the, the pea pickers in one area, and uh, he told me which one it was, the Imperial Valley or one of those places. And, uh, and then they went into uh, the cotton workers. There's a lot of cotton growing in Southern California in those years. And uh, of course, the, the cops came by and arrested him a lot of times. And uh, Archie said to me, we never won anything except jail. And he was in the clink in 1934 when Bob Merriman was organizing the Cal students and the great strike and all that stuff. Archie was in jail. He couldn't do it. And uh, he missed it. He missed the general strike and all that business. Uh, but he arrived back about a year, a year later, 1935 or six, I think. And uh, he continued his, uh, his evil doings, you know, um, he, uh, he was committed to the labor movement. Um, when the Spanish Civil War broke out, uh, he was very eager to go to Spain. In fact, you were talking about the, uh, the, the trouble of the State Department letting people get in there and everything like that. Well, Archie applied twice uh, and was never accepted. They wouldn't give him a passport to go to to Europe. They didn't say they were going to Spain. That was illegal to do. But a lot of guys, you know, like Bill Bailey went to France and then then to Spain. I mean, Bill Bailey had his troubles too, but uh, you know, Archie couldn't couldn't get through this barrier. So, uh, but unlike everybody else I ever knew, Archie Brown, you know, stowed away on a boat, on a ship and he slept under somebody's bed you know, and, or under the machinery that was in the, in the bottom of the boat. And uh, he got to Spain, but he couldn't walk too well. He got to Paris, actually, and then went over the mountains. Um, but he was pretty stiff. He said it was, you know, very difficult. Um, he arrived late because he, he couldn't get out till 1938. Near, you know, the, he did see some of the big battles. Um, you know, he was there for the Anyway, so they saw the leadership that he he had this promise, you know, they they recognized this guy's an old foot soldier. He can plan and everything. And uh, I found another note not that long ago where uh, he's called in by the um, the commissar of the uh, of the Lincoln Battalion. Uh, 
George Watt, and he says, uh, Archie, we're going to promote you to uh, uh, be in the commissar for the company that you're going over the top with. And Archie says to him, but I haven't ever gone over the top. And Watt says to him, oh, you'll learn. And he did. And they wound up on top of a mountain, uh, the Hill 666, famous because it was solid rock. And the fascists had artillery zooming in and they just bombed away. There were no, no aviation available to, to intercept the fascist attack. They just stood there and held the ground. And in the middle of this whole, you know, terrible nightmare of scene, Archie gets up and he starts singing the Internationale. And he sings it loudly until he has the whole battalion singing the Internationale. And they go through the whole thing. Now, you'll find that written in several books. Alva Bessie's book, Men in Battle, for example, looks like that. Only they didn't talk about it as the international. They said Archie got them singing the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> Mill Wolf's book, the same. You know, he just a little editorializing a bit, but you know, it was it was could have been, it could have been the Star Spangled Banner. He was a certain patriot. He came back, you know, and he said uh, he was really he's stunned when when Spain fell, and he said, "Do you know what it's like?" He said to have your ass kicked. And he immediately, you know, began working to get the United States into the war. As soon as Pearl Harbor came down, he had, he was given speeches in uh, San Francisco. People again, you know, remembered them. He talking about how we have to get bundles for Britain. Never mind that the party didn't want to break, break ranks with the, the Stalinist Communist Party. He, Archie was talking for bundles for Britain before that. And of course, then the Soviets invaded and it was a whole different story. War changed. You know, one of the things that always strikes me is that if, uh, you know, we talk about the Normandy landings as part of America's glory, you know, in Normandy, June 6th, 44, and all that. If they didn't have that, you know what would have happened? You know who would have liberated Normandy? The Red Army. There was nothing to stop the Red Army after Stalingrad, right? Forward march. So anyway, that, uh, you know, Archie was aware of that kind of stuff. He also, as a, he was, he got into the World War II Army a little late and he wound up uh, um, in the Occupation Army in Germany for a while. And he wanted to go to get an education, he wanted to get involved in a electricity work or something like that when he came back, because you know he was a little more skilled than what he was doing. And uh, they said, "You're a premature anti-fascist. We can't send you over." I mean, it's one of those. He wrote a letter to Hun, 1946, acknowledging that you know another badge of honor. And of course, then he continued it back in uh, 1946 after the war. Archie ran for pre uh, governor of California on a write-in ticket. On a write-in ticket, the Communist Party. How many votes did he get, Stephanie? But 25,000. Huh? How's that? Pretty good. <laughs> and he, he later ran for other offices. You know, Congress, he ran one time and he ran for. His, the stuff in the in the city office here in San Francisco and whatnot. Um, and he when when the, the the Cold War came down so severely, Archie went underground because he was elected to be an officer in the ILWU, and that was illegal by the terms of Taft Hartley. So rather than go and get arrested for Taft Hartley, Archie went underground as many Communist Party leaders did. He was gone for four years, actually a little bit more than four years. And um, he got to see Hun, he told me, or the family, and she would meet him in over in Oakland somewhere. But he got to see the family twice at two family gatherings, one, one in uh, Arizona and one in somewhere off Southern California, or I guess Hun had moved down. And Hun's house, by the way, was, was eight, our shifts for the FBI, three guys every single day for four years. 
right? She'd walk out to go shopping, and there was a cop behind her. And uh, and that's what it went. And 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 he finally came out. And uh, by that time, the the federal laws were making it a little easier. Except that there was the Landrum Griffin Act, which was enforcing the idea that nobody could be a communist and a union officer. And in 1961, the first person who was arrested for being a communist union officer and was announced on, at the waterfront, they went out on the pier and they grabbed him. They, it was Archie was the first one to go. And the guy who announced it was Robert Kennedy. You know, the attorney general for, you know, the Kennedy administration. And, uh, you know, and Archie took that case and appealed it. He appealed it, he appealed it, and he appealed it and kept appealing it. As he did all those other times, he didn't uh, get locked up too bad. I left out a story that he was once accused of murder. And that murder trial in San Francisco went on for months, acquitted, of course. And, uh, and he finally won. And the Supreme Court said that you, you could be a communist. <laughs> you could be a communist and uh, it's still really okay, right? It's legal. And now it's legal to be that. So anyway, I was going to end this. I'm writing a book about uh, each of the vets that come up, a uh, book of poetry. And I was thinking I'd read you what I had written about Archie. But I was looking through some papers the other day and I want to read to you something that Archie wrote. This is, I call it a found poem. You know how people go over to driftwood, you know, and they, they lacquer it, put it on the wall, call it found art. This is a found poem. It's a letter written to Hun on October 31st, 1938, after the farewell parade in Barcelona when the international brigades were withdrawn from Spain and the war was not over because they were still fighting, but the IBs were being pulled out and sent home. What will impress, what impresses me is his eloquence, his passion. Men gather in the plaza. After a time, the bugle sounded. We fell into ranks nine abroad and proceeded to march. Overhead zoomed the air fleet. The little mosques came down almost to the treetops. The chattos and bombers performed higher up. The people cheered. Signs, the crowd kept getting thicker and thicker. Signs proclaimed, international brothers, we will never forget you. We will fight to the last man so that all of us could be free from fascism. Our adopted sons, Spain loves you. The people's salutation, Archie goes on, knew no bounds. They showered us with flowers. Girls broke through the lines and showered us with kisses. One would run out with tears on her cheeks. She would grab the first man and pull him down. Then several others broke through. I never felt so good. After each attack, we would bravely reform our ranks and plunge onward, only to find that the enemy had pulled a surprise attack on us. This kept on for several kilometers. It was glorious. An ovation none of us shall forget. Right? Eloquent. Right, beautiful, a love letter. Um, what I always also like, one other story, I know that I was at, at uh, the house over in San Francisco uh, one night and uh, one of your, one of Archie's in-laws or somebody had put in a uh, hot tub and uh, I looked at the hot tub and then there was a little sign above it and it said, nothing is too good for the working class. Thank you. So well, thanks, Peter. Peter's actually did a 12 hour interview with Archie. Um,
<laughs> so anyway, we're going to make a slight change in the program. You're, get, you're going to get here from the family soon. But first, I thought I'd have David Bacon come up, who um, part of the, uh, the IOW's solidarity was this backing a, a lot of the um, um, anti-apartheid and all the solidarity movements. And as, as a as a, another veteran of those movements and a veteran photographer, I'm gonna, we're going to call David to um, tell you about them. And then after the family, we're going to have questions and answers. Buenos dias a todos y todos. Um, also, I wanted to, before saying anything, I wanted to just note that uh, one of Archie's comrades, Alex Bagwell, just died recently, um, who was a hero of the anti-apartheid movement. And I um, just wanted to note Alex's passing. Um, Archie was my teacher, really. Um, when I was trying to figure out what it meant to be committed to socialism and to be a union organizer, which I was for about 30 years, at the same time, Archie was the person who helped me. So we've heard from, from Peter a lot about Archie's history. And some of those things really hit me a lot. Um, when my youngest daughter was little, her favorite movie was Newsies, which was the musical about the strike against Pulitzer in New York in, 19, in 1899. And I only learned later that Archie himself had been an organizer of the um, Newsy strike in Oakland. Um, what it meant to me is that Archie became a red really young. Um, and that was true of a lot of people that went to Spain. Um, that's why the State Department didn't give him a passport. And um, that was what they had against him and why he had to stow away. Um, when I was just becoming politically aware myself, I think I was about 12, when Archie got called by the House on american, american Activities Committee. And as he started to speak, refusing to name names, that was when the demonstrators burst into the hearing room and Archie was thrown out. And that was the beginning of the end for UAC, which was a big presence in, in my youth being a red diaper baby myself. Um, in Archie's book, the most important political work that you could do in a union was to educate rank and file workers and to help them become activists. When he ran for union office as a communist, his point was first, I think, to get workers themselves to think about more radical ideas, especially socialist ideas, and then also to challenge the federal government's prohibition, um, as, as Peter's told us. Also, the government indicted him, and the Supreme Court overturned the prohibition. And Archie said that laws that violate the political and labor rights of working people have to be challenged directly, legally in court and politically out in the world. And today, when we see the Supreme Court striking down law after law that we fought for, um, Archie would tell us we have to fight. One reason why the Bay Area has a radical political tradition is because of the ILWU. But it's not just the ILWU as an institution. It's the fact that the union brought together and educated workers, as Brian has talked to us, who then worked in political campaigns, civil rights demonstrations, school and workplace integration, and a myriad of other social struggles. And creating that active membership was the job of the left-wingers in the union, like Archie. And Archie would have surely said communists among them. That's what Archie believed. Power and left-wing politics in the labor movement come from the bottom up. And only if an organized left fight is there that fights for them. So in my own work as a union organizer, I tried to use every strike, every plant that closed, throwing workers onto the sidewalk as an opportunity for us to learn together about the reality of the world that we live in. And that's what Archie taught me. I don't think he learned that in Spain, but he shared it with those people who went to Spain from the surging working class movements of the 30s. This was their style of work. That's what made them effective. After all, they left for Spain within just a year or two of the general strike, the greatest labor upsurge that we've had here. What that means is that defeating fascism in Spain was the overarching need of the working class movement all over the world, more important even than the union. And the Abraham Lincoln Brigade was the product of that idea. But what Archie and the vets also had in common was the commitment to fight for a more just world, not just against the injustice of this one. 
Since he went to Spain, the economic inequality and the social cost of capitalism haven't changed. If anything, they've become even more extreme. Today, hating capitalism, even by name, has become popular again. In my youth, just using the word capitalism was enough to get you red baited. But Archie didn't just hate capitalism. He wasn't afraid to ask, what's the alternative? Can society provide a full life for all people, not just more efficient commodity production? And asking that question can still get you in trouble, and it certainly did for Archie. But he wasn't afraid to answer it either. From his youth, he was fired by the idea that we can gain enough political power to end poverty and unemployment and racism and discrimination. And he and his comrades said society could be organized to ensure social and economic justice for all people. Working people have proposed alternatives to capitalism for over a hundred years, socialism, communism, anarchism, and more. And those who went to Spain were fighting for this vision as much as they were fighting against Franco. This is the legacy that Archie left me. It's up to us who say that there is an alternative not only to proclaim it and advocate for it, but to organize the majority of our people to fight for it. And if there is to be any alternative, it will only exist because we who hate the current system are willing to fight to bring a new one into being. And that's what Archie taught me. Thank you. Thank you. So now you're going to get to hear from the family. They're going to talk about Archie and also Han. And I just have to say that Han led the was a very active in the Bay Area Post. She was a treasure, and Han was just a whole lot of fun. She was unlike a lot, several of the people we knew, but anyway, she, um, she was a lot of fun. And um, so now I'm going to have Stephanie, uh, Han and Archie's daughter, and, and after that we're going to hear from. Hi guys. Um, they asked me to talk a little bit about the personal side of Archie Brown. It's hard to separate that from all the rest of it. And you've heard all the fan, you know, so many wonderful things about Archie. He's a fantastic person. Uh, it's a privilege that he's being honored like this today. And I feel honored myself to be asked to say a few words. This event that's honoring Archie and the ILWU and the Spanish Civil War those were two of the most important things in his life and therefore in mine and my family's. Archie's participation in the international brigades and his and Hun's continuing dedication to the fight against fascism was instrumental in our upbringing. We knew all the music, we went to all the events, and I can't tell you how emotional it was when we were finally able to travel to Spain in 1996 to celebrate the founding of the brigades and feel the love and appreciation of the Spanish people. Honestly, it was a transformative experience. Archie wasn't with us on that trip as he had died at the end of 1990. We always say we're kind of glad that he died before the fall of the Soviet Union. Although I like to think he would have rolled with those punches and had found a way to keep his ideals intact. Uh, and keep fighting the good fight. And I want to say that I'm really proud to be the daughter of the working class. Being an ILWU family gave us so much good income, health care, generous pension. Uh, I wanted to say that the housing cooperative at St. Francis Square, which was a joint venture between the union and the employers, has uh, been the home to many people in our family including my sister who's here and her son. I'm going to skip the whole thing I was going to tell you about Archie riding the rails when he was 13, because that's already been told. But that's a great story. And one time I did ask him if he wanted to ever go back to Sioux City, where they had he had grown up till he was 13. And he told me, hell no, it was a terrible experience. He hated it and he couldn't, was glad to not be there. Forget about it. <laughs> I want to talk to you about my mom a little bit. She was born Esther Matlin. She was the baby of her family, and that's why she was always called Hunt. Uh, she and Archie originally met when she was a teenager at a YCL conference that was held at her home in Ontario, Southern California. Um, and she 
was volunteered to be uh, like a driver, help people get back and forth from LA. Um, and Archie was one of her passengers. After she graduated from high school, she couldn't wait to get out of the small town. She hightailed it to the Bay Area. She had a couple of, her, one of her a sister for sure was here. And that's where she ran into Archie again. And they were part of that wonderful, progressive San Francisco crowd of the 30s. They shared the same hopes and aspirations and ideals and ideas about how to go about making change. They both joined the Communist Party and dedicated themselves to the work at hand. Hun was always determined to have a family and a balanced life. Archie was not so sure. He thought maybe it was better to just, you know, devote themselves to the cause, to the struggle. Um, my mother liked to tell me about how she had to like lobby for each kid. You know, so my brother was born in 1939 when Archie got back from Spain. My sister Susie was born in 1943 before uh, Archie went off to World War II. I was born when he got back. And then my mother said, and then when she wanted a fourth kid, he said, oh yeah, oh, fine, no problem. You know, that's great. <laughs> so um, that Betsy was born in 1951 and then it was the Cold War. And that's uh, when Archie went underground as you've been, uh, has been explained. And he quietly disappeared, my mother, rented out our house on Petrillo Hill. She packed us up. We went out the back door through a neighbor's yard, got into a car that was hiding on another street. And we went to uh, back to Ontario to live with her dad. He was very nice to us, very sweet, wonderful grandfather. And, you know, for me, it was kind of a fun life to live out there in a small town, hot weather in the summer, run around barefoot, you know, go swimming, hang out with your cousins. And uh, I don't think it was so fun for my folks. And, you know, uh, we were hounded by the FBI, as you've heard. And uh, we did get together maybe, I don't know how many times, but I remember one time getting picked up from a piano lesson in a car that was not our own. My whole family was in there with our own, I recognize some of our belongings. And uh, I said, well, what's going on? And my brother said, ha ha, we're going on vacation. Ha, ha, ha. And we drove around. We had to change cars a couple of times. I remember um, being, we got out of the car and we went into a pedestrian subway and came out the other side of the street, got picked up again. And then we just parked on some street and we just sat there. And pretty soon there's Archie coming up whistling, just, you know, very calm and you know we were supposed to act really cool but we just went crazy and yelling and screaming and then we went off and had a uh a pretty good vacation we just went camping we were out there in the I remember we were in Oregon and we went to Yellowstone we did you know we had we had a nice time but I'm pretty sure we weren't being followed by the FBI uh when McCarthy was finally discredited and the Cold War was thawing we moved back to San Francisco and I have to say, I think it was a difficult transition for my dad to try to fo be folded back into this family of, you know, rambunctious kids. We were raised very permissively by my mom. And, you know, he just, you know, he, it was hard for him to, to be an authority figure to us because we didn't really need, you know, we didn't need him. We had our mom, we had our nice grandpa, you know, but uh, <laughs> we persevered, my mother persevered. And as my sister pointed out to me, you know, a lot of marriages didn't make it through that period, but uh, Han and Archie did. And um, she had a rule and we always had to be home for dinner. And after dinner, my dad often went off to a meeting or there was one at the house and uh, we had a saying, he did really, this is what he said. If you have a meeting, you gotta go. If you got two meetings, you have to choose which one. If you've got three meetings, you go to the movies. Uh, he, he was he had a good sense of humor and he loved to tell crazy puns and dad jokes and um, a lot of people that I was um, when I said I was going to talk about my dad and on a personal level they said make sure you mention his sense of humor you know he really did have it and especially when he wasn't preoccupied with the project we had him to ourselves he was a lot of fun he could spin fantastic tales off the top of his head 
or, you know, when we were in the car or when he would, when we would beg him, tell us a story before we went to bed. And he, we had a whole mythology. It went on for years and gosh, I wish I'd have written him down. Uh, Peter stole my line about nothing is too good for the working class, but that's how I was going to say. Archie was a true believer, a dedicated internationalist, communist, and revolutionary. He was dogged in his efforts for the betterment of humanity. And one of his favorite sayings, nothing is too good for the working class. That's how we were raised up. Thanks, guys. The what? Okay, I'll say that at the end. Um, okay, so now our, our next speaker, and, and traditionally we honor different groups that were the Abraham Lincoln Brigade vets. So this time we're going to enter um, Longshoremen, all the Abraham Lincoln Brigade vets were Longshoremen. And I'm going to have Sean, um, Archie's grandkid. I read the list of names, it's a long list. Right. Um, I'm Sean. I'm one of Hunt and Archie's nine grandchildren. And uh, I'm going to just read these. You're a little taller than most of us. I'm going to try to move up these mics. I can just speak a little louder, too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Archie Lincoln's hearing people talk about Hunt and Archie brought back a lot of memories. And so that was, that was nice. But um, my job is to honor all of these uh, longshoremen that were vets. And so I'm just going to go. Well, I would just say that, that Hunt and Archie, um, you know, I came along a little later in all of the social activism that was happening and you know i saw a lot of it when i was a child and it you know I, I knew it was going on but i wasn't as much of a part of it as around it but the overarching thing that i remember was a sense of values that we all learned from our grandparents and it was like fairness and doing what's right were, you know was very important you know that justice was important and is worth working for and so when we were growing up and going to school and stuff we would always be like oh that's not fair that's not right and then the teachers would be like where'd you come from kid you know so you know that was always uh, a a good background for us to come from and and then um you know, I ended up, I'm in a member of the uh, electricians union here in the city. And um, we, that tradition is going down through our family. And so that's been good for us, right? Because it's a good life being a union member. Um, so these are some people who were longshoremen and I believe also vets, right? All of these people were, and, and, it always amazes me the dedication to just uproot your life and go fight in another country, right? It's amazing. So um, there's Archie Brown, Frank Brown, Bill Bailey, Dutch Schultz, George K, Alva Bessie, Nate Thornton, Julius Rodriguez, Walter Shutram Jr., Wilbur Ed Wellman, James Moore Jones, Virgil Lonnie Morris, Max Katz, Simonoff Christ Thompson, Otto Ernst Lemke, Edward Robinson, and David Robert Altman and they all came back from spain and uh, the following people did not come back they died in spain oliver law 
Henry Paul Good, William Julius Conley, Frederick Joseph Cook, Alex Cecil Kunstlich, Isidore Schrenzel, Morris Henry Wickman, Joseph Zamaret, Benjamin Carr Smith, Barney Spaulding, and Walter Elmer O'Kane. This may be a moment of silence. Think of all of those people. Thank you. So in a few minutes, we're going to start the questions and answers. And then after that, we'll have a, a reception. Um, oh, should I turn this down? What, the Q&A, right. But before that, I just want to acknowledge this is part of the Labor Fest Festival and that um, Steve Zeltzer is here as one of the organizers of Labor Fest. Thank you, Steve. The what? Books. Right. And we also on the back table there, we have books for sale. What you do is you go up there, they actually have prices, and you bring the one you want up to the up to the cash register up there. And then in a little bit, we'll so now we're about ready to take questions for a while, and then we'll have some food and we can continue our reception. Um do you have some questions? Okay. That's a really good question. We would actually hope to get into that. Um, the solidarity movement in the, in fact, okay, right. So, um, um, God, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. My memory's gone for personal pronouns, but one of the editors of, of the dispatchers here and a old labor um, activist. Um, so anyway, he asked the question is, he's reminding us that the ILWU took part in the anti-apartheid movement um, and many other movements as well, the boycott of chili chips and, and um, part of the, the entire solidarity movement. In fact, I first became acquainted with the Longshoremen. I first heard about them in 1973, right after the coup in Chile. And, and I was sort of, cra it was like at a time, you know, I was crashing at somebody's house and they said, well, you can sleep over, but at 4 p.m., 4 a.m. tomorrow, we're all gonna wake up and go over to the docks because the Longshoremen said that if we stand there and pretend we're a picket line, they, they'll, they'll honor our picket line and not cross. It was a, it was a ship from Chile boycotting the, the coup that had just happened. And I'm sure that Archie must've been one of those people. Okay, so do we have any more questions? Any the what? I think Archie introduced. Yeah, I believe Archie introduced it, and I'm. If anybody else has any more memories of Archie in in those um, um, solidarity movement, which which really made the ILWU, in the same way that you know the, the vets when we uh, did our support of of um, El Salvador and in, in Nicaragua. Um, anyway, any other? Um, Questions or comments? We also have Harvey Schwartz here. Harvey, do you want to fill in anything that I forgot? Harvey's one of the great um, ILWU historians. Do you, you want to come up here, Harvey, and say a few words? I think the question related to the to 1984, when there was a, a, a about a 10 day strike that was pulled it was technically a wildcat strike, which means it wasn't sanctioned by the international. Um, but there were a lot of people involved um, and um, um, a, number of, a number of leaders. Uh, Jack Heyman was one, uh, who's you know, still, uh, still active in, in, in the Bay Area. Um, and what happened was it was successful finally. And it was well remembered because sometime later after part date ended, Nelson Mandela made a made a, a statement, I believe, in Oakland, um, in a rather large public setting, in which he thanked the LW for for the backup. So you know, it's kind of it's one of the many landmark issues, you know, in civil rights. You go back to 1934, really. Anyway, that's that's a brief. History. 
It's a great chance. <laughs> ah. So, Robin, would you like to come up here and answer that question about the the question is how did the ILWU educate its members, especially about racism? Yeah, I mean, I think we address it somewhat in our exhibit on the 1934 strike that um, there was not work opportunity on the docks for the most part for non-white people in the San Francisco Bay Area prior to 1934 or elsewhere, just on this coast in general. Um, we address it in that. We address it in the catalog. Um, I also think that the to some extent, it's sort of under addressed in the union, but it's very much covered in a lot of the oral histories that Harvey has produced, which are all digitized at this point and made available to the members. So, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, we could cover that too. Um, really, there's just so much. Um, actually, in 1934, there had been um, a lily white organization was broken in 1919. It didn't, no longer existed. And there had been some uh, black workers who had been invited in by the employer to, to work during that 1919 strike, which was lost. They're still on a couple of docks in San Francisco. Um, Harry Bridges, who was considered the great founder of the union and others, Henry Smith and others, um, sent the word out, we, we, we would like the black people to be involved in our strike and to not work during the strike if they're called upon by the employer. We just went around to black churches in San Francisco and said, look, we know the past. We think it's wrong. It's going to be different. If we win, everybody gets equal shot at a job. And so no black workers struck. In fact, they came to the union hall. They're walking up the stairs on uh, Mission Stewart. Henry Schmidt is looking down. And he says, here are these guys coming. And he says to these guys, where you been? Um, and the African American guy said, oh, "Yes, you know." And so then they came and joined the union. And Bridges stuck with it. He was able to do it. In fact, he gives this statement. He gave a statement in, in his oral history. I didn't do the oral history tapes, but his his wife did. Uh, Nikki did, and I use them in this book called Solidarity Stories. Um, you know, Bridges said I had to go to the membership after the strike. You know, we're talking 1934. Um, the racism was at least as naked then as it as it is now in many quarters of the, of the society. Uh, he went to the members and he said, look, we got to take these people in and use the term no discrimination. There won't be any discrimination. Everybody's going to have an equal shot. And, and that's and they went with it. They, they went along with them. Um, by 1959, Local 10, which is Longshore Local in San Francisco, was, was 51% African-American. And it's still majority African-American. Um, the the effort to, to try to, to deal, you know, with this problem has gone on and on throughout the whole history of the LW. In the union's newspaper, for example, 1950s, there were article after article after article complaining about some black per person being arrested and being tortured or having to go to jail for doing, you know, very, nothing serious at all. And they were article after article after you, not in the San Francisco Chronicle, you didn't see that message, but in the ILW Dispatcher every month, you know, it would go, and I, I had to look at all those old newspapers to do research, to do a book, you know. So it is a long, long and deep tradition. Um, I don't mean to go on so long, but I hope I give you a bit of an answer. Yeah. Stockton, one, the union grew discriminating against black people and then Harvey Bridges, Harry Bridges came, then he took the charge. The Japanese workers. Uh, yeah, I do know something about that incident. I, you, do you know we did an article on that once? Did you? Did, yeah, well, well, okay. well anyway, uh, you professor remembered it. In 1940, uh, 40, 45, at the end of the Second World War, 
in Stockton, California, the ILW said, well, the people getting released from, I guess you'd call them concentration camps where the Japanese Americans had been rounded up. Um, we'd like to help them out. These guys, nobody else is going to give them, get, help them get work. So why don't we offer them opportunities to go through our dispatch hall in Stockton? This is called the Stockton unit of ILW, long, uh, ILW warehouse local number six, which was very strong at that time. It had a lot of members at that time, actually 18,000 at that time. It was much smaller now. But anyway, so uh, what happened was they're going to go up there, a couple of guys go up there, and the members up there said, we will not accept you. We will not send you to work through the hall. So Bridges is looking at that. And he says, uh, you know, they can't be, we can't do that. He had been working with the War Relocation Authority to help the, to help the, uh, the Japanese Americans get jobs. And so he goes up there, drives up there with Joe Lynch, who may remember, some of us may remember, oh, uh, Brian would probably remember Joe. He, they go up there and Harry actually physically takes the charter off the wall and says, you guys are suspended because this is un it's against the constitution of the ILWU and of local six as well. So they're suspended and so they have a trial and some of the guys are suspended in themselves. And finally, the, they, they give the guys in, in Stockton, it's a small unit, but they gave in and they said, okay, we'll dispatch the Japanese Americans. I mean, so it's a lot, you know, it's a long, 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 long tradition. In fact, before that, during the war itself in 1942, the longtime secretary of treasurer complained and I think it was mentioned, I'm sorry, you already mentioned that, didn't you? I think you might have. Anyway, um, uh, Louis Goblat, he goes before a, a, a federal a hearing board and says, you know, he, this is playing Hitler's game. He used terminology like that. You can't put the Japanese Americans into camps. Um, this will long be remembered as a terrible travesty. You know, very, very few people were willing to stand up and do that. But an ILW guy did, you know, and an important person at that time. 42, he was still with the CIO Industrial Union Council, but he becomes Secretary Treasurer of the ILW in 1943, holds that job to 1977, becomes a major figure in the union's history. So, I mean, there are, example, there are many, many examples. I had some notes with more and more examples about that, which I don't think I'll go to because I've taken up too much time. Anyway, thank you for letting me be part of the program. add that Harvey's book Solidarity Stories also touches on a number of these issues and he has it on the back table there. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that um, in terms of the union's education, the value of the history, like they, the union very much values its history and its traditions. Um, I, we don't necessarily cover race in all of our trainings, but um, we have, the union has helped support many publications that we definitely use in our trainings including Harvey's book. Um, there's another book that came out by a gentleman named professor in Illinois named Peter Cole that talks a lot about the um, relationship between the ILWU here in the San Francisco Bay Area and in Durban, South Africa, and the anti-apartheid movement. And I don't know what else I have to say. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that some of us in the room live in St. Francis Square. And, um, you know, our motto in 1963 was formulated by the, the, the saying that all families, all people who, all residents who live in the square will value living together in harmony be it race, religion, and, um, and uh, color. And so that, that's what we live on and live by. And just in terms of the rank and file, when we started in 63, after the devastating thing that the government did in San Francisco by wiping out the African American homes in our district, in our neighborhood, in the Fillmore, you know, um, they ensured the beginning of the co op was that the, the 
almost 50, 60 percent of the longshoremen people, families moving in. But they made sure at the time that it was very balanced racially. So that, you know, it was like 50 50 back then. And they could do it not legally, not because of the government, and they would not allow it, but that's exactly what happened. So that's the basis, and it's still the basis of we, we don't do that exactly in terms of who we allow in and out anymore. But that's what the co op still is. And it's over in the Fillmore. It's a beautiful, interesting thing. And I can't remember the name of the Right. So in St. Francis uh, Square, that's a, pro a housing project for union that allows union members in it. And uh, a cooperative. <laughs> the cooperative, I remember interviewing Elaine Yoneda in there <laughs> and, and many other people. Anyone else? Um, well, in that case, I think it, we'll, we'll have a reception now. There's some food back there. Before I do that, I'd like to um, call Dennis up from Alba, who would like to say a few words. I want, I want to thank everybody for coming. <laughs> And we'll have some food and, and we can keep talking. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dennis Smeany. I'm the uh, executive assistant for the ALBA office. Uh, thank you all for coming here. I just want to let everybody know, um, you know, everybody here and everybody watching on Zoom, Zoom should absolutely be signed up for our mailing list. So find us on alba-valve.org. Uh, you can find us on our social media channels there. Sign up for our email and mailing list. I have copies of the volunteer magazine at the table back there. Please take them. Um, and yeah, please, um, you know, please in contact. We are having events in the future. Our next event uh, will be online. It is a... Um, a film screening of Sacco and Vanzetti, uh, a film by one of Alpo's board members, Peter Miller, uh, which will be on August 23rd, the anniversary of the execution of Sacco and Vanzetti. We will be doing that event with the with uh, with the DSA fund. So that should be very, very nice. Uh, we also I can announce that uh, we are um, we are um, have we are moving towards finalizing our annual Suxman lecture and we will be doing it with uh, with um, Karen Nussbaum of the, excuse me, nine to five. And I believe there's one other word I'm supposed to mention. Sorry about this. Uh, from the founding director of Working America. So an important labor leader and we're happy to be in conversation with her. So um, yeah, uh, I hope everybody enjoys the food here. Thank you everybody for on Zoom and I'll kick it back to Richard to take us home. Yeah, I wanna thank you all. And I thought I'd mention just once again, the um, uh, on December 3rd, the, the um, Howard Zinn Book Fair that's going to be at um, San Francisco City College on 16th admission. They were going to be showing all, all Eyes Were on Madrid, the the thing, the um mu sort of musical story of the of the uh, Abraham Lincoln Brigade in the Spanish Civil War that we produced. And great, thank you, and thanks everybody for coming. And we can remember the Viva the, the Cuban Revolution back there. We have some food, Cuban food.